excuse me, being a living sacrifice. And it's from Romans chapter 12, from verse 1 and 2. The Lord has blessed us as a church treasurer, but it's a platform that the youth ministry would give us to be visible as young people. It's a platform that the youth ministry would give us to get our gifts out and in action. All right? I am sad it looks like we missed a bit of that. And those of you that have heard me speak on some occasions, I prefer to speak the way the Spirit of God burdens my heart. All right? So the kind of young people, that, the kind of youth that you would expect that you want at All Saints Cathedral are empowered youth. Empowered youth. All right? They are not weak youth. They are a youth with a voice. They are youth that pray. That they are youth that understand the word of God. They are youth that have a vision. Praise the Lord. Yes, it is not a group of some weak people. Praise the Lord. Yes, there are young ladies that you approach and you know you're meeting someone who knows the Lord. And if you're not serious, you will not say nonsense before them. Those are the youth of All Saints Cathedral that I know. So I come to you. I might sound tough, but I'm not tough. I'm just trying to set the stage for us to understand that the issue of serving the Lord and setting ourselves apart are serious matters. The enemy is targeting your category. Why? Because he knows the potential that lies in you. The enemy knows if you're put to the right direction, you can transform families. You can transform a nation. You can transform this church. The enemy knows that. And so he will do everything possible to shut you out. Unfortunately, we don't seem to notice that. But the whole world is crying out for young men and women who know the Lord. The families are crying out. Parents are crying out. They wish their children knew the Lord. Employers are looking for people they can trust. So when the Bible says, and Paul is urging us, he's not commanding us, I think I'm commanding you, I should urge you. Paul is urging us. He's saying, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. I know we don't like to dwell much on the Old Testament, but if you appreciate and know that the youth ministry is a place where lives are transformed, is a place where lives are changed, is a place where lives are enhanced, if you appreciate and understand that the stages of a youth is where a me metamorphosis happens, the transformation from being immature to being mature, if you understand, like we, under, we learned in science, from a pupa stage to an adult stage, if you understand that this transformation happens when you are in your kind of life, in your kind of age group, if you understand that that transformation must happen, then you cannot take this stage lightly. You cannot take this stage lightly. So in addition to the physical features, the body, everything else that is getting transformed about you. The Lord is interested in the transformation from the inside, in the inside of you. And he compares it to a living sacrifice. It's a, it's a metaphor. I, I learned that, you know, some of these things, I learned them late. But uh, thank God I learned them. So a metaphor, a figure of speech in which a word or a, a phrase is applied on an object uh, which it is not literally applicable. 
If I call you a living sacrifice, it's a metaphor. It's a word. It does not necessarily refer to, you know, being slain as a sacrifice. But it's, 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 it's a figure of speech. So in the Old Testament, and you'll find it, this in the book of Leviticus, if you sinned, you would bring an animal before the priest. You read the book of Leviticus, it outlines everything. So you would bring an animal as a sacrifice. I do not have time to go through it. I don't want to lose your, your attention. <laughs> You'd bring the animal. They would uh, cut the animal or slaughter the animal either as a burnt offering um, or whichever other offering you'd want to categorize it as. And then your sin would be forgiven on the account that you have given a sacrifice. Are we together? That's the Old Testament teaching about sacrifice. So there are two reasons why a sacrifice would be given. Number one, it would either be for cleansing from sin by means of a burnt offering or a sin offering or a guilt offering. So that was one category. You've offered a sacrifice for the cleansing of your sin. The second option was the expression of thanksgiving. You bring an animal just to say thank you to God. And it's slaughtered and presented before the altar and burnt before the Lord as a thanksgiving offering. Are we together? Yes. Now, the sacrifices by themselves, as we will learn shortly, were insufficient because God was looking for Beyond the sacrifice, he was looking for a softened, a humbled heart by obedience and devotion to him. That's why the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Of what use is it if you bring the animal and we slaughter it on behalf of your sin and then you go back to the same sin? It was a repetitive thing. That's the Old Testament Economy, Old Testament way of doing things. Are we together up to that point? Yes. So, the New Testament comes in. The New Testament economy, if I may put it like that. So, the New Testament stresses that the Old Testament sacrifices of blood did not actually take away the sin. Rather, they pointed to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So, the Old Testament way of presenting a sacrifice, I'm trying to lay a foundation for you to appreciate the word being a living sacrifice. Because I imagine it will confuse us if we don't get a background for it. Are we together? So, now Jesus becomes the perfect sacrifice. Alright? Jesus becomes the perfect sacrifice. Because by his shedding, the shedding of his blood on the cross, on the cross, uh, he achieved for us that perfect sacrifice, that testament dispensation. That equivalently, he's saying, present yourself as a dedicated life. Dedicate your life. Dedicate yourself to his service. Are we together? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a hot afternoon, and uh, it's likely that um, I will lose you if I don't keep uh, making you participate. So, just to wrap up the bit of the, the sacrifice aspect of Leviticus, so that we move on faster to something else. There are like four aspects that I want to summarize here. All right? Number one, God wants us to live holy lives in dedicated service to him. All right? If you're writing, please note the keyword: God wants us to live holy lives. All right? If there is any sacrifice you're going to present before the Lord that is going to be meaningful, it is a holy life. All right? 
So any sin, any sin we indulge in, any sin that we are involved in, it is an attack, it is an offense to his holiness. All right? Any aspect of sin in our lives is an attack on God's holiness. He does not take it lightly. Number two, by stressing the need for a perfect sacrifice, because if you read uh, Leviticus, the animal that you would bring before the Lord would be a perfect animal. It would be an animal without blemish. All right? So in the same lens, he's demanding for a perfect sacrifice, meaning he expects the best. All right? God is not expecting half-hearted commitment. Are we together? The kind of sacrifice he's asking for is the best. If you're to serve him, serve him to the best of your ability. Number three, the worship of a holy God is a serious business. We are relating this to sacrifice. The way an animal would be sacrificed before the Lord, the kind of sacrifice he is demanding from us in acts of worship. The worship of a holy God is a serious business, underline serious business. It requires careful, sincere preparation, not only on the part of the worshiper, but also on the part of the leader, the worship leader. All right? So our being in this place like right now, in a session of worship, all right, it is not something you do casually. In fact, if you do it casually, then you would have wasted your time because you won't reap the benefits of it. It is something that must be done or treated as serious business. So you are in the right place and hopefully doing the right serious business with the Lord. And uh, the shedding of blood is an absolute requirement for the forgiveness of sin. So, four things I've talked about. God demanding holy lives, God demanding our very best, God demanding that our business with him is treated with seriousness, and lastly, the shedding of blood, which in this case uh, was achieved through Jesus Christ when he spilled his blood for us on the cross at Calvary. So, when you talk about a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, there is the shedding of blood involved. But the shedding of blood that involved here, Jesus has already done that for us. What is expected of us now is as a living sacrifice, it relates to a consecrated life. Please note, a consecrated life. It relates to a life set apart for the Lord. It relates to a life that demands commitment. It relates to a life that might even be a bit inconveniencing, but it relates to giving yourself. We are very used to asking God to give us. It is a common thing. We come to God to say, God, please give me. Please, God, give me. But in this context, it is what you are giving to God. And the best you can give to God is yourself. If everything I've said has not made sense, just, just take that one only. The best you can give to God is yourself. And this is what Paul is saying, that you present yourself, you present yourself, as a living sacrifice. It demands for a consecrated life. There are choices that you will have to make. And as a young man, as a young lady, the options are many. The pressures are real. 
but the Lord is demanding that you choose consecration. Praise the Lord. He's, he's, he's demanding that you choose to be set apart. Set apart from what? Set apart from what? You know, there's a scripture. There's a scripture we used to like as young people. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Set apart for what? Set apart from what? So, if the Lord is calling you and me to a life of being set apart as young people, what is he asking us to set ourselves apart from? He's asking us to set ourselves apart from a number of things. Number one, the Bible talks about youthful lusts of the flesh. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee from youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So the Lord wants to set you apart. I wish I had time to, to share with you my testimony. I got saved as a young man just because I would follow my mother. My mother was saved, so I would just follow her to church and you know, initially I did it as a child, you know, in primary school. But I committed myself as an adult in my S5. Committed my life to Christ. But I have seen the distinction between those that commit their lives to Christ and those that don't. Because the distinction is so clear, even in my own family. But what the Lord is asking us right now he wants to set you apart. Set you apart from what? A number of things. The wickedness of the world. The corruption of the world. The contamination of the world. The immorality of the world. The drunkenness. The Bible says do not get drunk with wine. Instead be filled with the Spirit. The Lord is saying, I want to set you apart as a living sacrifice consecrated. And those are the young men who are going to overcome. You know, I heard uh, people talking about overcomers, young overcomers. Yes, but the response wasn't as powerful. Are there young overcomers here? Hallelujah. Yes, we were young overcomers during our lot. And trust me, up to now, up to now, we move as a generation. I know the people I had in my fellowship as young overcomers. And, and the Lord has been gracious. We're overcoming. It's a great time to bond as friends. It's a great time to live as a generation. You move together as a team. All right? You shield one another from trouble. And so if you don't belong to any fellowship, if you're still moving alone, you're vulnerable. Please be part of a fellowship. As a young man, as a young lady, it will save you the troubles of this world. The Lord is demanding for a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Set apart, consecrated life. Why? Why is he insisting on this? Because the stampede is on. The pressure is on. Everyone wants a piece of the young people. Everyone wants to recruit the young people. Whether it's a music club, whether it's a sports club, whether it's um, a bank. I didn't tell you where I work. I work in a bank. I work at DFCU Bank. Whether it is any... Everyone is looking for young people. For right reasons and for wrong reasons. So the pressure is on. And whether you like it, whether you know it or you do not, you are, you are being cornered. You are being influenced. You are being influenced by what you see. You are being influenced by the company that surrounds you. 
you are being influenced by what you watch on social media, you are being influenced. Whether you like it or you do not, the question is, are you conforming to it? Or, like the Bible is saying, and Paul is challenging us, he's saying, be transformed. All right? We'll read it again, um, our, our portion of Scripture for focus uh, this, this afternoon. He says, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your lives as a living sacrifice. I have dwelt a lot on that. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform. All right? Do not conform. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. There's an image that has gotten stuck in my head. It happened a number of years back, but every time I, spoke, I speak to young people, this image comes back. This image of a young girl, this young girl just joined the bank. I have been in banking. I've been to a number of them. But she had just joined the bank. At the time when banks and other institutions do end-of-year parties, all right? So very innocent from school, she's just joined, and there's end-of-year party. All sorts of drinks were available. I think she wanted to... <laughs> she just wanted to sample everything. All right? So this first experience of this young girl in a free environment where drinks are not on sale, you can drink as much as you want, you can mix whichever versions you want to mix, she goes on, <laughs> on a rampage. We were supposed to take her back home. She was using our car. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This image has remained in my head. She made a new sense of herself. A new sense of herself. And right now, some of you are still shielded. But if you were allowed some freedom... Would you survive, young overcomer? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this is where the, this is where the issue of, of youth ministry, the issue of young overcomers, the issue of fellowship, the issue of transformation, the issue of this bonding happens. This is where people look out for you. I hope she survived. I have not been in touch but I felt pity for her. There are people we ready to receive you in the workplace to initiate you into wrongdoing. It happens at all levels. The writer says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I don't know the right words I can use to express this point. But this is where the real action needs to happen. The Lord is calling us to a consecrated life. He's calling us to a life of being set apart for Him. He's calling us to know His word. There are, there are certain things that can only happen when you are a young man, when you are a youth. There are certain scriptures that can only make sense when you are a youth. Like when the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has in store for me. It can only apply when you are young. <laughs> when you are old, we have seen. There is nothing new. <laughs> there is no miracle we are expecting. You are old. You have lived out your life. But when you are young, I respect young people. Today they are here. The next day you find them in big places. When I was a youth chairperson, there are some here we used to call locusts. <laughs> I see some of them. They are now big people. You know, Joel was here presenting. They said, we want to call the gentleman. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I have a lot of respect for young people. You do not know what the future has for them. Things can turn in no minute. Yes, but you must make, you must make the best of that opportunity. You must make the best. You know, 
oh my God, over how do I come closer to you? The youth ministry in this place hmm, had reached a level where you were setting the pace for this church as youth ministry. Why? Because there was consecration. People would spend nights here in prayer. People would seek the Lord, and the Lord would speak to them, much as they were young. And whenever they stood up to speak, they said things that were meaningful, and the church listened. And they appointed them to council committees. Some of you here, I can see some of you that were on council committees. All right? Yes, because you spoke the oracles of God. If I told you the people we served with on that council, you'd be amazed. They were highly placed people. The only way I could speak was by quoting scripture. Because I had no experience to, to say anything. I mean, some were judges, they would quote the law. Others were, you know, highly placed people speaking out of experience. Me, I had to, to rely on the Bible. I said, but the scriptures say, and then they pay attention. Where, where did we lose it? Why are we not as, maybe I've not been around for some time. Maybe I've not been around. Who intimidated us? Who taught by the, oh my God, why should I say it? Who said that the AGM of the youth? Maybe let me leave that one. <laughs> hey, Jesus of Nazareth. You should know the potential that you have. And you should know that the enemy is fighting that potential. And trust me, this window will one day close. This window will one day close. You will not have an opportunity to say the things you want to say. We will write you off. We will say, you mean that generation? Good for nothing. They are neither here nor there. This is your time. If you must say it, you must say it now. And you must say it loud enough for everyone else to hear it. I benefited from that. That's why I can speak to you the way I'm speaking. I do not want to use the ladder that I used and then remove it so that no one else comes after me. No, this ladder must offer an opportunity for many more young people to come up. Transformation is what I'm talking about. And this is what the, the Bible is saying. Now, there are very unique things about this transformation that I want to quickly uh, uh, go through and uh, I will be done. Hallelujah. This transformation, first and foremost, this transformation is possible. Some of you are thinking, but how does that happen? How does that happen? This transformation is possible. It is possible that right now you consider yourself not worthy. You consider yourself as if messed up, as if not, not well aligned. But it is possible that the Lord can do an inner transformation in you. Right now, you don't seem like you have all put together. But this transformation is possible in Christ Jesus. Number two, this transformation, this transformation is personal. It's, it's, it's personal. It's to do with you. You make a choice. It, it's, it's, some, it's, it's an opportunity God has given us. He does not force us. I can only speak to you, but the choice is within your heart. It's you that says, you know what? I am not happy with my life. I do not think I was meant to be the way I am. It's you that does a reflection of your life. It's a personal thing. You know, you know, you know the story of Samson and Delilah. Samson knew who he was. He knew that he was a powerful man. And he knew he had a secret. We know that story, don't we? 
Yes, but it took his <laughs> confession to derive what the secret was. And the Bible says he became like any other man. You are not like any other man unless you choose like Samson to let go. The young people in this place, the men, the gentlemen in this service, we are unique, we are special, we can do great stuff. The attention now has been put mainly on the girl child and we seem to have been abandoned a bit, but we can pick ourselves up. We can pick ourselves up. So this transformation is personal, personal choice. This transformation is progressional. Yes, it, it is an event on one hand because you must have an encounter with Christ, but it is a process. You begin to become more like him. But the Bible is appearing to us, please, if you are to attain your full potential, there are certain things you must get rid of. There is a certain way of life you must abandon. It looks attractive. Your friends are involved in it. It looks like fun. It looks like you're living your life, but you must abandon that lifestyle or else you will perish. You will perish if you live according to the standards of the world. The Bible is saying, do not conform to the pattern of the world. I see smart men in this place. I wish the outer could transform even the inside as well. There is an outcry. If you listen to our intercession here, thank you who led the intercession. Some led, led the intercession. Powerful intercession. A cry out to the Lord. The gentleman had better be serious. <laughs> yes, because this kind of prayer Man, it's, it's a serious prayer. So, what can I say? When Paul writes and is appealing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in a number of things. Now, number one, in speech. When you speak, what do you say? When you speak, your words, hmm? are your words corrupted by, by the kind of company that you have? Can we listen to your words? Are, are your words a defying? Hmm? He's saying, set them an example. They will give you a pulpit here. You know when we were, <laughs> for us we used to have a youth Sunday. I don't know where you lost it. And on the youth Sunday, it is the youth that would preach. I had an opportunity to preach in that pulpit several times. All right? Yes. But trust me, you, when you get to that pulpit, you must speak things that are sensible, even when you are a youth. All right? That's when you will keep having an opportunity to keep coming back. So the Bible is saying, set them an example. In your speech. Even at home. The Bible says. In your conduct. Alright. Set, uh, set an example for the believers. In speech. In conduct. In love. In faith. And in purity. Hallelujah. There's no, I studied economics, they use a phrase like, there's no free lunch. Yeah? In economics, just to say, they try to imply that don't expect people to give you free things. Whoever gives you something is because they're expecting something in return. So they use the phrase, there's no free lunch. All right? So do not expect to attain the levels that the Lord is asking you to attain without any form of sacrifice. Forget about it. 
All right? So, just to, to bring this to, to a close in a few more minutes. When you read um, in Romans chapter 6, a continuation of what we are studying, it says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not, do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Use your entire being. Right now, you know, there's opportunity opportunity to lead worship, opportunity to play instruments, opportunity to serve in different aspects, opportunity to serve as young people, the best you can do is to serve the Lord. Please, put to the best use of yourself. The Lord will show you where you fit, where you fit best. 1 Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, do you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says that two are united into one. Verse 18 says, Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. I could go on and on and on. One of the things that helped me, you know, when we were dating, you know, my, my Fridays, we would go out on Fridays, most of the Fridays would go out to have coffee and so on. Great moments to talk about ourselves, you know, I would talk to my fiancé then, we would talk about my family and everything and everything. Great moments. But, you know, one thing is leading to another because it's, it's a cool evening, you're out with someone you love. I had a small car, so I would be able to drop her back home. But one thing that kept ringing, the Holy Spirit would ring, keep ringing in my head, I would be coming for an overnight. We nobody had overnights. So the question, after this, would you lead an overnight? So you must be careful what you do because you're headed for an overnight. Praise the Lord. So it was like a check, a checkpoint. You, you, as if someone is standing behind you saying, but you know you're going for an overnight, so better watch out. And that kept us. That kept us. By the way, when there is no one in your life, life seems to be okay. You can pray. and <laughs> But the, the, the challenge is when someone comes into your life. Now, where you had locked up your heart, you open your heart and you become vulnerable. But even then, the Lord is able to sustain us. He's asking us to be transformed. To be transformed. To be transformed. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you that there is a remnant in this place. We thank you that there are young people that you want to transform. One thing that I want to assure you of, the Lord's will for your life, number one, is good. He cannot draw you to something which is not good. The Lord's will for your life is pleasing. Please trust him. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. It is good, it is pleasing, it is perfect. What makes you think that he has a hidden agenda, that he, he intends to do harm to you? Why do you fear? Why do you think serving the Lord will ruin your life? What makes you think that you're making a mistake committing your life to Christ? 
His will is good. His will is pleasing. His will is perfect. You're free to make choices, but you're not free to choose the consequences. Every choice you're making has consequences. Father, we thank you this, this, this evening. We thank you that there are mighty women and men gathered in this sanctuary that you're counting on for this generation. There is a remnant in this place that you're counting on for godly values in this crooked, depraved generation. There is a remnant in this room that you're counting on that even when the rest might wander, he will remain loyal to you. I thank you, Lord, for that remnant. I thank you for the, your transformational power that is personal in nature, that is transforming a young man listening to me this evening. I thank you for the encouragement that you are releasing to somebody in this place this evening. I thank you, Lord, that you are reviving the youth in this church. I thank you, Lord, that there's a remnant that will not lose them. Yes, you will rise up one more in the name of Jesus. The enemy could have come like a wave, but Lord, you raise a standard against the evil one concerning our young people in the name of Jesus. We will not give up. We will not give in. Lord, we know surely, as surely as the Lord lives, he will raise up a remnant. Yes, we will have a warrior who calls upon the name of the Lord in this place. Yes, we will have a warrior who knows the Lord amidst confusion, amidst immorality, amidst all forms of wickedness. You will raise up a remnant. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And friends, if you're here and you, you, you want to be that remnant, you're saying, God, I, I, I please, I, I choose you. I want to focus, to be set apart. Yes, a lot could be happening around us, but you're saying, God, please hold my hand. I want to make it. I want to make it. Yes, if you're there, please just join me here. We will pray with you. A young man in this place, you're saying, God, I need you. I must make it. Come, we, we stand together in prayer. Come, join me here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your power that transforms, for your power that delivers, for your power that works wonders. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, if you're there, if you're here and you want to say, Lord, I want to, to put my hand in your hand. I would gladly want to pray with you. You can put up your hand. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the transformation that is happening amongst us. Lord, we pray you raise a standard. You raise a standard that there will be a remnant that we can count on. All hope is not lost. We shall rejoice and be glad and celebrate your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's give another round of applause to Mr. Peter.